for our next talk. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, AWS and Facebook connectivity folks working on bringing the Magma products to AWS and some creative approaches to that moving forward. Uh, we've talked throughout the day about Magma being focused on reducing friction, reducing cost, and we believe ultimately uh, mm -hmm. cloud-based deployments combined with edge deployments are, are likely the successful model. So I'd like to welcome Sigit Priangano, uh, Pri Priangoro, I apologize for murdering your last name, uh, Sudi Kondi and Ravi Abdel. Yes, you're right, Phil. No worries. <laughs> yeah. uh, Sigit's a senior partner solutions architect focusing on edge and cloud at AWS. And yeah. Sudi is one of the development team at Facebook Connectivity. And Ravi Abdel is a, pr a principal consultant, telecom industry specialist at AWS. So gentlemen, take it away. Uh, would you mind please giving me the, the share, the permission, if you don't mind? Uh, Ravi Abdel. Yes. Kendall, can we yes. add Ravi as a co-host? I have it now. Thank you. Just did, Got yeah. It. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, first of all, thank you guys for having us today. We are very excited to be in this call. Uh, with me today is uh, Sigit Biryango, and he's a senior partner of architect at AWS, and Sudhi Kandi, who is network engineer at Facebook. And today we'll be spending some time talking about the overall solution overview for Magma on AWS, and we'll dive deep into the solution itself and the architecture, and we'll finish off with uh, a quick demo to show you some of the capabilities that we built uh, together. Now, before I uh, dive deep into the, the actual implementation, I would like to spend some time into really why does it matter to the industry. Now, if you look globally into the industry and how the new industries emerges in new sites that require uh, wireless connectivity, and the number of the new sites needed is growing dramatically as we see that. And actually, Harbor Research that they, they discuss the opportunities for industrial and commercial IoT deployment based in private LTE and 5G. And they've shown millions of new sites needed across different verticals. And if you look at the industrial and manufacturing vertical, you see 10 million and a half just for that particular sector. And this is the reason why we really need that to be scalable and the coverage needs to be really uh, consistent and the mobility is really needed. And also the time to set up a network, it has to be optimal. And the operation for those networks, it needs to be optimized and very cost effective. And additional of that, if we think about the devices that need to be running on those networks, the expectation really the number of devices will grow from 150 million, as we saw in 2017, to 750 million by the end of 2023. And for that to be really possible, MPN and 5G and LTE is really the needed technology to allow us to give this throughput and latency needed for this particular industry uh, segments. And unlike Wi-Fi, which has some limitation in power, and it, with Wi-Fi you get up to four watts in power, which which might not be optimal to for coverage with uh, private uh, LTE and 5G with the license spectrum or CBRS. You don't have that limitation, and you get better coverage further away from the base station, as well as the security the MPN in 5G and LTE provides will allow you to include physical security elements by having the SIM card and the mutual authentication needed in both sides of the network to make the connection happen, which is very suitable for a lot of use cases, which has very security uh, need requirements uh, for the privacy reasons and so on. And this is why really MPN is becoming very, very important and Magma is, is good fit for such uh, technologies. Now, AWS and Facebook has been working together trying to deploy Magma on AWS. And because of the nature of Magma being a distributed architecture and the capabilities that AWS provide for each cloud and the different offerings and different infrastructure to fulfill different use cases, AWS services was really a great fit for Magma use cases. And, and because of the complexity that can bring as well for managing distributed architecture, having an automation and having a single pane of glass was really essential 
to make the deployment of the Magma components in different edge cloud capabilities that AWS bring possible and manageable in a centralized location. And today we're going to spend some time talking to you about the automation framework that we built that will allow you to de deploy and provision Magma components on different AWS services. But I think before really we dive deep into the actual solution, it's really important to give you some overview about the edge services that we have at AWS and how we map that back to the Magma architecture. And for that, I'd like to uh, call and bring my colleague Sigit to take us uh, through that. Sigit. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Rabbit, for the introduction. So, um, as I already mentioned, um, from AWS, Rabbit and myself, we've been working with Facebook Magma team for the past few months and how you know, AWS services for the edge can help to deploy Magma. So as you can see on this picture, right, uh, AWS has a complete solution and services for uh, customers and partners such as Magma team to build interesting uh, applications, interesting network applications, right? So this is the services range from AWS region on the left hand side, as you can see, which consists of multiple availability zones. And also there's local zones and a cloud from point of presence, right? And if you can see on the middle there, there's on-premise facility. So this is where oh, AWS bring AWS outposts. So AWS outposts um, provides the same AWS hardware infrastructure, AWS services, AWS APIs, and tools such as you know, cloud formation, um, systems manager, uh, AWS uh, config to bring the developers the same experience when they have to build on the region, on the cloud or on the edge, right? So that's the goal. And if you can see a little bit on the middle there, you can see AWS Snowball. So AWS Snowball is rugged device. Um, it's commonly used outside of the data center. Uh, if you don't have any rack, you don't have any data center, AWS Snowball can help you to build Magma on premises, right? So it's, it's operating fully disconnected for customers that has limitation on connectivity, um, such as uh, mining sites or school districts or housing and residential area, right? There are a few projects that are going on with this condition. So no connectivity to the internet, no region connectivity, Snowball can help. And if you see the next picture, it will be a snow cone on top of the ship there, uh, shipping cargo, right? So it will be a snow cone is uh, the same family as Snowball, but with smaller form factor. It's like two kilograms, even smaller than a, your shoebox. So you can deploy private networks on this small, uh, services without any connectivity. And if, if you can see on the right hand side, there's a uh, IoT green grass, VR pass. So these are the AWS services that can be used to create applications on top of private networks, such as video analytics, right? Robotics application. So we have a few projects going on with video analytics, like in Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, we we deliver private networks and also social distancing video analytics so that uh, CMU campus can notify the officials if people are too close to each other and so on, right? So these are the services that can help uh, developers to do this. On the next slide, uh, let's go a little bit deeper on AWS Outpost, right? So as you can see, Outpost brings uh, native AWS services. Uh, infrastructure and operating models uh, to any data center. So basically, when developer use cloud formation, AWS config systems manager, uh, all the APIs that developers are used to deploy in AWS region, we also use that in our post. So you bring the cloud to on-premises, right? So this is where the terms edge cloud came from. And the good thing about Outpost is that it's fully managed and supported by AWS. 
there's at least one gig per second connection to the region so that sorry i have my alarm coming up so that uh, customers have access to the latest hardware software and do not have to worry about you know upgrading the 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 bios upgrading the software on on the services right so just like the database call we just use with your uh, you know usual apis so in this case customers and partners such as my team can develop and deploy uh, with the same experience that you have in the cloud and on premises okay so that's our post uh the next slide is about AWS snowball edge so snowball edge answers a requirement where the customers doesn't have a, a data center there's no connectivity there's no data center and uh, snowball edge is rugged it's as big as your uh, traveling briefcase so if you're traveling to another city you can have your briefcase that's what snowball is like right but it's rugged and it has 52 uh, virtual cpus it provides block and object storage and optional gpu so uh, advanced machine learning and video analytics can be done in this connected mode right and with snowball edge uh, customers and partners such as my team can build and deploy private networks for a rugged, disconnected, uh, non-data center uh, site environment. Okay, for example, we have customers in remote mining sites that want to build private networks, right? You can't put the data center there. Another use case is uh, safe and rescue operation or even a school district for this um, COVID-19 situation, right? We can deploy a private network with Snowball Edge. And on the next, uh, on the next slide for snow cone so snow cone is in the same family as snowball but with a, a much a smaller footprint right so it's about two kilograms even smaller than your shoe box size you, you buy a shoes right snow cone is about that size so it's smallest member of our LBA snow family, two kilograms, that it has eight terabytes of storage, three virtual CPUs, four gigabytes of memory. So with this, we can build a private network for a remote ruggedized uh, site requirement, right? For example, the, the first responders, right? They can carry snow on a backpack and provide a, a private network. For robotics, where in our reinvent session in 2020, we show our partnership with Ghost Robotics, and the robots with four lights carries the snow cone and access point to provide a walking uh, private networks, right? Even in a drone use case, where the drone can carry the private networks, and uh, snow cone fits very well uh, if you want to build private networks that requires portability. Uh, you can ship it to FedEx, UPS, and so on, right? And Magma team has been working with us to deploy access gateway on AWS no Cone, okay? And then the next slide, because we understand now AWS services for the edge, now we look how, how we design this, right? So the first use case here is uh, for connected campus, meaning enterprise sites that has internet connectivity, has connection to AWS region. So if you can see on the top box here, the top box mean AWS cloud, AWS region. Um, customers and partners can deploy provisioning and subscriber function, such as HSS or UDM, right? And if our customer use CBRS, for example, uh, CBRS SaaS can be deployed on the, on the cloud as well. Same thing with control plane, MME, HSS, AMF, SMF can be deployed on the region. Okay. And then on outpost, so outpost sits on premises there, uh, on the on the bottom box. Customers and partners such as Magma team can deploy the user plane function, such as P gateway, S gateway, security gateway, or UPF 
for low latency connectivity to uh, outdoor or indoor radio networks. Right? You just have to provide L2 or L3 uh, router switches to connect to the uh, radio networks. And there's also a possibility to deploy a full mobile core deployment, meaning that both uh, control and user plane can be an outpost. At the same time, the Mac application, Mac means uh, mobile edge cloud or multi access edge cloud. Those applications that require low latency, such as you know, real time video analytics, can be deployed on outpost. Right? So, this is and a great use case for low latency applications. So this is the first, first architecture. On the next slide, I will show you the snow cone, which is we are working with uh, Facebook Magma team as well, that you know we deploy user plane on snow cone, while the rest of uh, the core functions on the cloud to save space and to provide local breakout to the customers, right? So for example, uh, as gateway, uh, P gateway, or magma access gateway can be on snow cone, two kilograms, about eight inches long. So it's fully for, fully portable. So we can send it inside the remote mining sites, uh, even in school zones, right? So this is the snow cone reference. And the next slide is the same use cases, but with more. Uh, compute power, right? There's some uh, customers that requires application on on the edge, for example, real time video analytics for physical and social distancing, or worker safety, or uh, zone fencing in university in school zones. So both the uh, 4G or 5G core and the applications can be put on the snowball. Okay. So that's where Snowball is very useful with PC2 virtual CPU. And this, to save time, the next slide is about uh, combining both use cases, right? So you have, uh, you have customers with main campus, such as a mining company that has a main campus with outpost with connectivity with the region. At the same time, there's a remote panel site a mining site that requires no family, such as no corner snowball. And the last reference architecture here I want to show in the next slide is where a customer doesn't need, uh, you know, a real time use cases, but customers with IoT sensors, both throughput, and the customer doesn't want to deploy. Uh, snow or outpost, they can just deploy radio networks on site and put all the core uh, networks control and user play on the cloud. And this is very useful for our customers that want to have basic connectivity, right? And Magmatin has deployed this as well. Electron should be for, uh, for from uh, Facebook, Magmatin will, will do a demo. It's very interesting. So stay tuned. And this will be a uh, use case that we can be more in this call as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. So on this case, there's end-to-end -end, uh, magma solution on AWS. So Rabi, my colleague here, has been working with Facebook team to to do it. So I will hand over back to Rabi. Uh, go ahead, Rabi. Uh, thank you, Sigit, for the introduction. That was really great. Um, so of yeah. course, when we worked with Facebook, uh, to come up with a magma end-to-end -end solution in AWS. Uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to do that is really working backward from the challenges facing the industry in launching uh, those products into, into the market. And if you remember when I started my talk about the millions of new sites being rolling out and the need for deploying end-to-end -end mobile network for those sites, it has to be done in automated fashion. It has to be done in, in a way that easy to scale and the approach we took is really by looking at the challenges that uh, are facing the industry of launching those new new services so if we start by really just launching a product and if you look at how csps uh, do it today it's a daunting exercise to figure out 
what is the right uh, bill of materials, what are the right components that has to work together to build the end-to-end -end, uh, service. And with AWS, because we do have the, the rich partner ecosystem and the APN network, that will allow us to quickly uh, get the partners onboarded into an end-to-end -end solution because those solution and those partner already running AWS and using a consistent API across each other. And that makes it really easier to streamline uh, the process of really the partner network that we have in AWS. And the second thing is really about how do you really place an order and how do you service, uh, do the fulfillment for the service itself. And if you look at AWS and the tools that and services we provide in that area, is all around, like if you look at AWS service catalog and the possibility to instantiate an entire infrastructure by clicking a button. And that was a great tool to allow us to streamline a lot of the ordering process uh, for that. And the fact that uh, everything in AWS is running as, as a code, as infrastructure as a code, then it will make it easier to uh, version control all the infrastructure and deploy it in a matter of, uh, of minutes and have that ready and up and running. And third thing is around how do you take the service to be live and how do you manage the, the continuous integration, continuous deployment of Magma components on AWS infrastructure. And we do have off the shelf uh, AWS services and tools that allow us to, uh, to do that in a configurable uh, fashion. You, so AWS allows you to create your different pipelines and configure different triggers into those events and create your own also flows integrated into that pipeline to allow you to integrate testing and manual approval to roll out any updates into uh, the network. And finally, when we talk about operating uh, the network, it has to be done in a consistent way. And the CloudWatch and our third party orchestration solution will allow also easier to maintain and operate the entire network by leveraging our marketplace for those uh, offering uh, as well. So taking this into account, we see the, the three use cases that can take advantage of uh, a full Magma end-to-end -end solution. And AWS will be a typical uh, CSP uh, providing and offering MPN services to their enterprise customer, as well as CSPs uh, providing fixed wireless access to their uh, customer and enabling the broadband services to be uh, rolled out specifically for uh, rural areas where connectivity is very uh, limited. Uh, and finally, the automation framework certainly can be taken advantage of within the CSP's public mobile network itself and leveraging those capabilities of lifecycle management of both the core and the RAM network in using that automation framework that I will explain more in details in the next slide. Now, to look at the architecture that we really put together, there are a few things I would like to just highlight in this architecture. Uh, the first thing is really what is running in AWS region. And if you look at the diagram, we do have the, uh, all the services running in AWS region alongside the control plane and any IT application that is supporting this private network. For example, if it was a video analytics application, so you have all the application control plan running in, in, the, in the region itself with the possibility, of course, to run those application in the edge location as well to provide better uh, latency. And the reason why this is possible because as it gets explained, the AWS outpost, if you have it running on your own premise, that's just an extension to your AWS region. And the same experience, the same console you use in to, to, to manage and control your AWS account will be used to manage and control your on-premise environment uh, as well. And that makes it possible for the same automation framework, the same pipelines you have in AWS region to manage and lifecycle the infrastructure that you also have on-premise. And this is, makes it possible to deploy Magma components either in the region directly with no change, you can still also deploy it into the on-premise by just changing the configuration and the selection, the choices of where to deploy those Magma component. And if we look at the remote sites and, uh, and the Sigrid explained about the snowball and the snow cone devices that we have, the provisioning of those devices and shipping them with the right image that is needed to 
run with the network is also done automatically using the automation framework. And not just that, the automation framework also gives you the API and endpoints to allow any portal system to be integrated into this automation pipeline that will allow the ordering fulfillment and the service fulfillment of this MPN to be done in an automated fashion. And finally, this automation pipeline and specifically the AWS code pipeline capabilities that we have within that will allow the repository that contains the actual code to be integrated within this pipeline so any push or any change into the repository will trigger the pipeline and as a result you will have the ability to test that in your testing environment before you roll this update to the production and that's all done automatically within the framework that we have and finally the last thing I want to say is the marketplace will allow you to deploy any application to support and run on top of this MPN network from our uh, APN network in, in marketplace. And before I hand over to for the demo so you can see things in action, I'd like just to clarify that uh, the conceptually any of the components that's supported by Magma can be part of an SKU that will be part of this end-to-end -end, uh, building block. And certainly the AWS marketplace will have all the application from our ISV uh, vendors to also work alongside the solution that will provide the end-to-end -end for the uh, for the specific vertical for the industry that we're trying to target. And with that, I'd like to uh, hand over to uh, Sudhi to take you through the, the demo. Thanks, Ravi. Um, I am going to share my screen. All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon for the folks in the Bay Area and hello for everyone else in different time zones. My name is Sudhi. I am a network engineer with uh, Facebook. And today I'm going to be talking about deploying Magma on AWS. My talk today is mainly sp spread out over four different categories. We'll first start out by discussing the Magma architecture and the workflow for deploying all the Magma components on AWS, followed by discussing the data plane elements, deploying the data plane elements on AWS regions, as well as looking at far edge scenarios using snow, uh, snow cone and outpost, like, uh, like Ruby and Sigit mentioned. And finally, we'll talk about building Magma, using the Magma source code and building uh, custom artifacts on the fly using AWS resources. Um, after the slides are completed, we'll spend most of our time looking through a video demonstration and we'll also have a small sneak peek of snow cone coming in between. All right, so let's get started. Our motivation today is that we want to enable any user who has a credit card to be able to deploy the Magma Core with a consistent, repeatable, frictionless and pay as you go manner. We want to ensure that they are not encumbered by any CapEx to deploy Magma. So to go towards this journey, we start at the AWS marketplace. The user goes to the marketplace, finds a CloudStrapper AMI, and uses this AMI to deploy something called as a CloudStrapper node. Now CloudStrapper runs on Ubuntu 20.04 today, and it's deployed on a T3 micro instance. So from a resource standpoint, it's really not that if it, it's not it's not resource heavy. It's actually pretty simple, and um, it should be on the free tier. You can think of the cloud strapper as the, the, um, the conductor of a symphony orchestra. It's the one single point of contact that gets to interact with AWS, gets to interact with Terraform, Ansible, and any number of tools that we use to deploy, uh, deploy Magma services today and be able to do it in a very consistent fashion. The AMI allows us to make sure that all the dependencies that are required to deploy any of the Magma services are already pre-configured on the cloud strapper. So the user uses this CloudStrapper instance and it deploys the orchestrator in one of the regions. And as soon as that is done, now we've completed the control path. So then the next question becomes, how do we deploy the data path? So the CloudStrapper, we use that and go back to the marketplace, find the access gateway AMI. And using that, we deploy an access gateway in one of the regions and connect it with the orchestrator. Now that we've done this once, we can use the same template file to repeat that same process in the same gateway or go to another region, or use the same EC2 templates, the AMI, because these gateways are running EC2 environment, we can use the same AMI and go to a near edge site, like an outpost, or even go out to a snow cone in a far edge scenario. So the question now becomes, this workflow sounds very good, but how easy is easy? 
So let's look at the orchestrator first. At the simplest level, the Magma Orchestrator is a collection of orchestrator images and Helm charts. Now, because we want the process to deploy to be as simple as possible, we bring in our Cloud Strapper node. The Cloud Strapper node, it uses a bunch of template files where we generate certificates for the deployment. We generate, we specify geography constraints for where the orchestrator needs to be deployed. So for instance, US West one versus US East two, we can make a ge geographic affinity towards where it needs to be deployed. The domain name that's associated with the orchestrator um, and any additional modifications we, we may wanna make on the Terraform side, we would do all of that on the Cloud Strapper. The Cloud Strapper runs Ansible and it inter interacts with Terraform to create the, the orchestrator. Now going a little bit deeper into the orchestrator, we can further subdivide the orchestrator into three layers. We start out by deploying the AWS services. Cloud Strapper has all the necessary credentials to interact directly with AWS. So it goes ahead and instantiates all the AWS services and we use a variety of services to realize the whole infra starting from EKS, the Elastic Compute, uh, Elastic File System, Elastic Search, Search Manager. And from there, we layer on top of it, the data store. Because the orchestrator, which includes the NMS for Magma, maintains quite a bit of state, we do use AWS's RDS instances, and we use one for the orchestrator and one for the NMS. So once we're done with the AWS services and data store, we now have the entire infrastructure we need to deploy Magma on top of that, which we do in step number three. In step three, the container Im images are finally applied onto the infrastructure that we deployed, uh, that we deployed previously. And then we get to see all the end-to-end -end systems come together. The Magma Orchestrator has functionalities right, right from the NMS, which allows us to do full lifecycle management of uh, the, the access gateway and even the entire, uh, entire ecosystem. Um, and also maintains subscriber databases. It maintains, uh, it, it allows us to aggregate logs, metrics, events, all from the gateways. And all of this runs on the infrastructure we just put uh, that the Cloud Strapper assisted in, in deploying. So now that we've deployed the control plane, we go to the data plane. The question then becomes, how quickly can we deploy it? And how can we use the same methodology to replicate to near and far edge scenarios? We again start this journey at the Cloud Strapper, but instead of filling out Terraform, Terraform related uh, information in the Cloud Strapper, we specify site and gateway level specifics. Cloud Strapper makes use of AWS's cloud formation stack and it deploys a, v, a VPC, which we call as a site, with all the networking, uh, all the networking resources required, and within that site, we realize a gateway. And the gateway is obviously it, it, it is powered by the AMI that's already in the market in the marketplace. Having done this once, if we go to a location where a customer provides an edge site, we can go ahead and deploy the same gateway using the same AMI onto a snow cone or an edge on an or an outpost. So it's that simple to deploy resources in, in AWS. So then comes the question, how about the distro? How, how do we make a customized distribution? How do we build it and create artifacts on the, on the fly? So again, we start our journey at the Cloud Strapper. The Cloud Strapper in this case goes ahead and instantiates an EC2 or a Lambda instance. Now this is where we do this in two steps. Step one is to create a build environment where we can say this is where all of our build process is going to happen. And when we create the build environment, we then go ahead and configure it to have all the dependencies needed to build all the, all the Magma images. And once built, they're then pushed over to the image repository. In this case, it could be Docker Hub or some cloud provided container registry. Or, um, and then we also push the Helm charts either to GitHub or to another cloud provider code repository. It's important to remember that this build node is a very on-demand construct. It may be built with extreme amount of resources, but it's only built for a very short amount of time. It's a burst resource that's required. At this point, I'd like to pause my presentation here and move over to some demonstrations. We're gonna be doing three demos today. We'll start out by first deploying an entire orchestrator. We'll first do the orchestrator followed by deploying the data plane elements and then finally, we'll finish out our presentation by looking at a demo for how we build Magma artifacts. The demo is going to start at the, at the place where we have already deployed a Cloud Strapper instance using an AMI. 
So let's get started. The Cloud Strapper instance has been deployed and we're going to SSH into that particular node. Once we're in the node, we'll first make sure that Cloud Strapper has all the necessary credentials to communicate with AWS, to communicate with GitHub, and to communicate with Docker so that it can pull all the container images and Helm charts that are required. Having done that, the next thing to do is to configure our orchestrator. We like to provide some information in terms of how we want to run, how we want to deploy this orchestrator. We give it a cluster name. We provide a DNS subdomain. We provide the, the label of the container images that we're going to be pulling out, the version of Magma that we'll be deploying based on the GitHub tag, and finally, the repository where we'll, from where we'll be getting the Helm charts. In this instance, we're deploying the orchestrator in US Southeast 2, which happens to be Sydney. And we can see that there are no EKS instances or um, EC2 instances running in that particular domain. And again, um, the subdomain we're using, it again also does not exist on Route 53 and there are no key pairs that exist. So when we run the Ansible playbook, all of this should get generated and we'll have a fully functioning um, orchestrator after the run. The last thing we want to make sure here is to see that the container images actually exist in our Docker registry. And we validated for all the four images that we need that the tag 1.3.0 actually exists. This is looking validating that the Helm charts exist in the repo that we're looking into. And at this point, we're ready to start running our Ansible playbook. It's a single playbook. And this entire playbook started around 1248 UTC and ended at 1306 UTC, finishing in about 18 minutes. In 18 minutes, we were able to go from zero to 100 and deployed a full orchestrator. I'd like to pause the video here for a second and draw a quick parallel with what we saw on the slides. The last three commands that, that Ansible ran were the three Terraform apply commands. If we look at, if we think of, think back to the sub steps required to deploy the orchestrator, the first Terraform apply deployed all the infrastructure, including the RDS instances onto, a, onto AWS. It instantiated all of them ready for Magma. In the second Terraform apply, we seed all the secrets that are necessary to interact with, the, with Magma. And in the final Terraform apply, now that all the infrastructure is in place, we deploy all of our Magma services on top of this cluster. At this point, if we, we, we the the Cloud Strapper node, it, it it will it will spit out the cube config, um, and as part of the installation, it'll also show the main.tf uh, the Terraform file along with um, the, the Terraform state file. In the, at the bottom of the screen, we see the name servers. Those name servers are what, we, what we'll need to forward all of, DNS, all of the DNS uh, resolutions to, to ensure that our domain, uh, that any public endpoint can resolve uh, the, 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 the addresses for the Magma components. We can now see that there are three EC2 instances running. We can also see that there is now an auto scaling group for, for these EC2 instances. Prior to running Terraform, uh, prior to running the Ansible playbook, we did not have any RDS instances, but now we have two of them, one for the NMS and one for the orchestrator. And finally, this is the final, uh, this is part of the, one of the services that's deployed on the, uh, on, on the stack. The Magma orchestrator is multi-tenant. It is org aware. So in this case, we have been able to go to the, the master org and create a mantle test organization that we're able to test. And we're able to reach this endpoint via the web browser, which means that the entire orchestrator deployment was fully successful. At this point, we're done with deploying the orchestrator. It took all of 18 minutes from the time we started the, the, tariff of the Ansible playbook to being able to validate, it started, it took 18 minutes to deploy and then a few checks here and there to make sure that all services came up. 
At this point, I'd like to move over to demo number two, where we deploy the, the gateway appliances. In this screen, we're, we're, we're modifying some of the cluster elements where we specify which region we'd like to deploy the specific access gateway in and which AMI, which is already present on the, uh, on the marketplace that we'd like to use to instantiate this particular gateway. We also would like to make sure that all the key pairs that we need to, associate, to connect with the gateways are present on AWS. Finally, we make, uh, make reference to the Stack Mantle Essentials uh, cloud formation stack, which would be needed if there were no key pairs that existed. But in this case, since we already have key pairs generated, we're going to, we're going to not need the Stack Mantle Essentials. Then we specify some site-specific information. The CIDR, the CIDR ranges for the VPC, the SGI interface, the eNodeB, and of course the name of the site. We specify all of that in this, in this YAML file. Followed by configuring the, the gateway, we specify an ID for the specific gateway and ensure that the variable association for the, uh, the image is, is set, set appropriately. At this point, we're ready to start rock and roll and deploy our site and gateway. We're going to do both of them at the same time. We'll deploy the Menlo Park site and Access Gateway A at the same time. This whole run started at 2118 UTC, ended at 2121 with a whole runtime of three minutes and 23 seconds. At this point, only the Access Gateway is provisioned with Magma base image, but it's not yet configured. We can see that there is a stack now for, for, for Menlo Park and we're, we're not able to see, we can see the EC2 instance that's deployed with it. We're now going to SSH into that environment. And without any additional configuration, we can all already see that the magma base image has already been loaded onto this particular gateway. Obviously, the check-in, the challenge error and the check-in would fail because this gateway has not been checked into any particular gateway, nor has it been configured to communicate with any particular gateway, or any particular orchestrator. To configure it, we run the second Ansible playbook, which is the AGW-configure, which goes ahead and deploys the control proxy.yaml, which ensures that the gateway talks to the correct um, orchestrator and the root ca.pem, which allows it to bootstrap. Currently in the demo, we're creating an access gateway B in the same site. So this is the part about scaling the number of gateways. Without having to do much configuration changes, we just run the Ansible playbook again with additional variables. And within about a minute and 19 seconds, we've deployed a second gateway. The runtime this time was a lot less because we, hadn't, we, we needn't have deployed another VPC. It was part of the same VPC. We'll now go ahead and configure the second gateway to communicate with the same orchestrator and, uh, and be, uh, have the, the root ca.pem, which would allow it to be bootstrapped. At this point, we'll, we'll go ahead and check this gateway into the, the orchestrator. We run a show gateway info.py on the access gateway, which gives us all the, uh, in, all the information that we would need to deploy, to add this to our NMS. Adding just the hardware ID and the challenge key and making sure that the gateways have the control proxy.yaml allows the association to happen between this cloud instance and that gateway instance. And the root ca.pem assures that there isn't a nefarious uh, gateway that's connecting to the cloud and that it is actually uh, it is actually authorized to connect to that particular cloud. Now to force a check-in, we're going to just restart the MagmaD service. It usually happens on a periodic basis, but just for the, for, for the, the purposes of this demo, we're going to restart it uh, forcefully. And there it is, we're fully checked in. All the services on the access gateway are running. This is version 1.3.2. And if we refresh the gateway, 
uh, we do see the health is good. I'd like to pause the demo here for a second and do a quick sidebar to the AWS snow cone. We received a snow cone from Amazon not too long ago, and within a few hours, we were able to work with them to uh, get the networking, the, the site component worked out uh, to a point where we were able to log into it and make sure that the snow cone was, had the, the, the base Debian image along with the Magma, Magma services running on it. So we're, this is just a sneak preview. We're not ready to pass traffic through this yet because the second interface hasn't been turned up. However, without doing any additional work, we now have MagmaD fully running on this particular gateway. All right, going back to the video, it'll take us into demo number three. Demo number three is all about building our Magma images from the Git, Git source control and pushing it to our Docker registry or our container registry and our Helm repository. To begin that process, we'll again validate that the AWS access key and the secret key are still valid and that we have the credentials for our Git repositories and Docker, Docker registry. We'll then go ahead and, and, and look at the build.yaml file where we'll make sure that we have the, the tag that we'd like to check out from GitHub correctly uh, identified. The orchestrator label that we'd like to um, publish is defined and the Helm repo that we'd like to publish to already exists. You can see this is a brand new repo with nothing in it. And after that, we're going to run the build provision.yaml. This particular Ansible playbook, it essentially just deploys a build node. This one took just around less than a minute, if that, to deploy the whole build node. We can see that this also used stack formation and there's a stack build, a stack build orchestrator in there. And if you look at the EC2 instance, it'll come up as a T2 extra large. And that is by design. The build process does take a little bit of resources. However, as I said in the beginning, this is a very on-demand resource and doesn't necessarily need to run at all times. We then run the Ansible playbook build configure build configure.yaml. This is the playbook that ultimately gets all the artifacts, deploys all the dependencies on this build node, and at the end of the, the whole run, it would have published all the artifacts to the various registries. The build started at 0104 and concluded at 0117. In just under 13 minutes, we've deployed all of our Helm, re, uh, Helm charts and the, um, and the four container images to the container registry. There it is, 1436, that's the Helm chart we were looking to publish. And here we're expecting to see the Mantle LTE tag, and there it is. So all the, all the, the artifacts have been published using a very quick framework, which requires very little manual intervention, and there are just a bunch of Ansible playbooks that ultimately simplify the entire experience for deploying uh, Magma services along with uh, building Magma services. At this point, this concludes the demonstration, but the question then becomes, what's next? Now, our principal architect of this work, Aron Tulsi, he made a PR this morning to push all of this code into Magma Experimental. It'll be available on GitHub once it's been merged in. All of this code already uh, will be merged in shortly, and the documentation has been written so that any part of it can be utilized at any point. Um, if, uh, if the AMIs don't actually exist yet, but the documentation here allows any developer to deploy their AMIs, uh, create, uh, create their instances, deploy their AMIs, and then go through the process of deploying their orchestrator uh, sites and gateways accordingly. I'd like to pause here and pass the baton back to, uh, back to, back to Phil. Thanks, Sudi. I think, our, I think uh, Kendall's taking it right now. Yes, I was going to take over. We do have a couple minutes um, for questions. Uh, if anyone had any question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them right now. Hey, uh, I have a question here. 
Uh, any chance to uh, run the access gateway uh, on some custom or custom hardware, custom gateway at the at the edge? So, any any options to avoid uh, snowballs, snow con, or it's against AWS ideas? Thank you. Great demo, by the way. Sure. Uh, I think um, Sigit or Ravi, if you guys want to take that question. Yes. So, uh, so uh, we have sent um, our snow cone to Sudi and Arun's team for um, exploration mode, right? And I think snow cone is a great. Uh, surface to start with because it's, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's smaller than your shoebox size. It's two kilograms, and we can send this to UPS or FedEx. And I think in the future, right, Sudi, and I think we can work together on Snowball and the larger devices. And in the future, if you if you pay attention to the NBS reinvent 2020, we'll have a snow cone with one U or two U size so that, that will be very interesting to try on so basically just to be honest with all the team here right we are exploring all the options to solve our customers uh, requirement together so we start with snow cone and then snowball and then in the future we'll work with the one you to use no for example but outputs so that's and that's basically we can share here yeah Anything to add there, Ravi? Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, quickly. No, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Now, we won't recommend that because we snow cone and snowball and outpost will give you that consistent experience and you will be able to leverage the same tool set and the same AMIs that you use in AWS region to deploy and provision those devices. But yeah, conceptually, uh, you can do that. 